Well, we are in 1 Thessalonians. We're beginning into chapter 5. Of course, the chapter and verses were added for our convenience. They're helpful. Um, But to an extent, we are continuing one letter to one people from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And it's uh, a section here that is answering questions that the Thessalonians had sent back with Timothy. Well, for the past many months, perhaps years, life has been uncertain. In many ways, the years ahead, the months ahead, may seem uncertain as well. With the pandemic, with the lockdowns, with mandates, with the uncertainty of, of maintaining jobs, maintaining income, with increasing pressure on Christians to not bear witness at work, in recreation, professional bodies, disciplining Christians for living according to their convictions. Time can feel very anxious in these days. Not just for people of faith, not just for Christians, for many people. Not just for professing Christians, but not just for those who who are just going along with the world. It is tempting to despair, to feel like the sky is falling. I made the mistake this week of listening to the radio, to talk radio. Um, There's so much happening that it's just wrong. It's just wrong in the world. I watched a YouTube video, probably not good for me, but things that are worrying and I, you can ramp yourself up into this feeling of despair that the, that the sky is falling. <clears throat> These questions that are coming from the Thessalonians, they were feeling this as well, right? This, this was questions about how do we make a living? How do I put food on the table for my family. I I believe. Now, I want to live in accordance with the gospel. I want to follow Christ faithfully, and that is having real consequences in my life. I can't do the job that I used to do. I'm not making the same income. I have to switch professions. My friends have shunned me. I'm being shut out of social events. I no longer have the business opportunities that I once had. These are questions that are coming from the Thessalonians. And we answered that a couple weeks ago. So When Paul is asked this question, he's asked a question about brotherly love. How do we love each other well? How do we support each other? He's asked a question about what about those who die before Christ has returned? Did they suffer for for no reason? What happens now? And Paul tells them that they will be raised. Jesus died and was raised again. If we are united in a death like his, we will be united in a resurrection like his. So comfort one another. Paul is asked 
this question about when will Jesus return? Jesus, when is Jesus coming back? Paul answers with words of encouragement that Jesus is coming back. Though we don't know when or how quickly, we do know that he is returning. We know that we want to be found doing his business when he returns. These verses are meant to comfort the, the Thessalonians, to give meaning to their sacrifice. They're not mere words. They're not just intellectual head knowledge. They're not ammunition for <laughs> one person to use as a platitude to tell the other person, don't worry about it. Your anxiety is lack of faith. Go your way. You, what you need is just to have more faith. They are real words of encouragement. That, and it's not just given to one person in Thessalonica. It's given to the church of the Thessalonians. So that they can encourage one another and build one another up. Our faith is not just have faith. It's, it's not just ephemeral, undefined, I'm a person of faith. Christian faith is faith in facts. Faith in Jesus Christ. His perfect life as our representative, his sacrificial death as our representative. Our hope is in Christ, in being grafted into Christ, in having been transferred from darkness into light, in being a part of God's story. In Ephesians chapter 1, the, the sweep of redemption is summarized in a couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 1 says, Before the foundation of the world, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. As we read this, there's two things. You're in one of two camps. My friends, do not be in the camp that is saying peace and security. I can decide later. I have plenty of time left. You do not know what the future holds. For you, the future should be anxious. You need to find peace and security in Jesus Christ. Do not presume that your best deeds earn any favor with God apart from faith. You must be born again. This is the call, loving call of Jesus, that you abandon your vision of yourself as a good person, that you repent and turn from idols to serve the living and true God. I'm gonna approach these verses in, in, under four headings. First, Christ's return will be at a time that cannot be predicted, so Christ's return sudden. Second, Christ's return will mean destruction for some. Third, Christ's return will mean salvation for others. And fourth, encourage and build one another up. 
Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Christ's return is sudden. This phrase, now concerning, marks the third question that was sent back with Timothy. The question was when? When? This is a question that comes up often right from the very beginning. We read Peter's response to the question of when. Concerning the times and the seasons, after Jesus was resurrected, the first thing that the apostles wanted to know was, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The saints under the altar in heaven likewise ask, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 6.10. And they are told to rest a little longer until the number is complete, until salvation is accomplished. In Matthew 24, at the end of Matthew 24 in verse 36, now concerning the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. The time of Jesus' return is set by God. In his humanity, Jesus did not reveal the hour. Now, don't get me wrong, the Son of God knows everything. There is perfect eternal unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus had two natures. He had a human nature and a God nature, a divine nature. And it is not fitting for humans to know the day and the hour. The angels don't know the day and the hour. Only God knows. Galatians 4. This timing of God, this is not merely about the end times. God's timing is God's timing throughout the Bible. It was God's timing when Jesus when the angels broke forth and announced that the, the birth of the Son of God. Galatians 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Ephesians 1 again, According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of, of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. There is a point at which we need to acknowledge, as Deuteronomy 29 did, does the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us, and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had spent three or maybe four weeks with the Thessalonians. No doubt the Thessalonians had learned about the law from their time in the synagogue. So they needed to know, and what Paul and Silas and Timothy focused their teaching efforts on was that Jesus was the Christ that Jesus must suffer and be killed for our sake, that he must be raised the third day for our justification, that he has ascended to heaven, that he intercedes for us, that he pleads his blood, and that he will return one day. That's a lot to teach in a short period of time. And yet, we read that they have no need for anything to be written to them. This is emphatic. 
Paul says, you yourselves, you yourselves, you, all of you, know you are fully aware. Paul has told them explicitly and exactly, in person, face to face, what he is about to write. This is not an exasperated, I told you this already. It is more emphatic. Recall how we spoke about this. And I will tell you again, in Philippians he says, to write these things again to you is not a burden to me. It's a safeguard for you. So this is all over that we do not know the day and the hour. The phrase, the day of the Lord, is a day of judgment. Isaiah 13 says, Wait, for the day of the Lord is near, as destruction from the Almighty it will come. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, if you you look up the day of the Lord, it is a day of great destruction. Jeremiah says, why? Why? Do you seek the day of the Lord? It's a day of utter destruction. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. In the same passage where he's saying to cast out the immoral brother, he says, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. 2 Peter 3.10 that we read earlier, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There is nothing that will not be, will not come to the light on that day. The Lord will come like a thief in the night. The Lord's return will be sudden 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven and with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Luke 12 also uses the metaphor of a thief, but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must be ready. For the Son of of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The point is not the secrecy of it, but the suddenness of his coming. The day of the Lord will come suddenly like a thief that comes in and smashes through the door and takes what he wants. It will be a day of judgment, destruction for some and vindication for others. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. It will be a day of destruction for some. The Roman Empire was known for its peace, for peace and security. The administrative vigor of the Roman Empire is what held it together. It's also what brought peace and security. It's what brought prosperity. If you can't move goods from one place to the other for fear of bandits, you don't have much for prosperity. Peace and security, travel, prosperity, in some ways, it was this very peace and security that was part of the fullness of the times that Jesus came in, that the gospel could spread on these good Roman roads, that Paul could travel in peace and security to spread this very word. 
but it is not where Paul found his trust. In fact, he used these roads to travel from Antioch where he had to be let down. He traveled from one place of persecution to another. He did not rely on the peace and security of the Roman Empire. The kings of Israel were constantly seeking peace and security in all the wrong places. They made alliances with Pharaoh, they made alliances with Assyria, they trusted in horses and chariots. They inquired of Baal instead of seeking God. A good example of this is King Ahaz, when the Edomites and the Philistines were raiding in Judah. He sent to the Assyrians for rescue, and he even robbed the temple to pay them off. Now, the Assyrians were not very good guys, and they took his money and then said, I bet you there's more there where that came from. King Ahaz was criticized, rightly so, for placing his trust in horses and chariots, in earthly security. His son Hezekiah placed his trust in God. He rolled out the words of the Assyrian messenger before God and he said, this is what they're saying about you, but you are my deliverer. What about these labor pains? Matthew 24 is not the easiest passage to interpret, but I believe it is speaking of both the destruction of the temple that was to come when he was giving that. And it did come, literally, within the generation of those still alive. But I think it's also speaking about the second coming of Jesus, both at the end of the Jewish age and at the end of the ages. In Matthew 24, verse 8, Jesus calls these, lay, these days but the beginning of the birth pain. I remember when, well, when Joe was pregnant with Billy and uh, she was overdue and we were waiting. We knew that it would come at any moment, but we didn't know exactly when. Days and days. When it was time, it was time. Matthew and Luke also point out that the end will be just like in the days of Noah, like in the days of Lot. Here we see that people will likewise be engaged in business. They'll be trading, buying, selling, marrying, and being given in marriage. Matthew 24, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. In Second Peter, we read of those who would mock. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. It may be that here in Thessalonica, some were beginning to mock their family members who, who they, these new Christians had kind of separated from, their former friends. Sudden destruction. As a result, of their disobedience, Adam and Eve and the entire creation were cursed. All women would experience increased pain in childbirth. All human beings are born under the law, under Adam, and we are all subject to the curse. We are all natural born sinners. A natural man does not need to be introduced to sin by society. There is no noble savage. The natural man sins, and loves it. We are all born guilty, and we are all born under the judgment of God. There will come a day of judgment in which all the deeds 
of every person will be exposed. And they will be judged according to an objective standard. And that standard will be God's standard. And that day, everyone who is not purely trusting in Christ's work in life and in death will be condemned to the lake of fire. That's just the truth. The only way of escape is to turn from idols and serve the living and true God. And this should be a wake-up call. If you're outside of Christ, the day of judgment is coming. Whether you die or if the Lord returns, and it could be at any time, And if your security is in anything other than Christ, then you will face sudden destruction. Hebrews 9, 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Christ's coming will be salvation for those who hope. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Unlike those who are surprised by the coming judgment, those who belong to Christ are children of light. Christians are not in darkness, not in ignorance, not in spiritual stupor, not deceived by the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. The darkness is a metaphor for remaining in your sin, as in John 3.19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Or Romans 1.21. For although they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Likewise, the light is a metaphor for salvation. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is classic because therefore language. Rather than simply laying out the law as the means to achieve blessing, Paul consistently reminds believers of who they are in Christ and then brings the therefore to the situation. You are a good tree, therefore bear good fruit. You are walking in the Spirit, therefore bear fruit of the Spirit. You are children of light, therefore you are not deceived. Since we belong to the day, so then. Last week's sleep was a euphemism for death. It's, it's tangential, it's, it's not directly a euphemism for death in this passage. It is spiritual death. Let us not act as though we were spiritually dead. Let us not be asleep in sin. Christians are of the day. That's not the time to be sleeping. The day is for keeping awake. It's for being sober. There's plenty of passages in the Bible that talk about drunkenness 
not being good. 1 Timothy, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Proverbs warns, warns about much wine. The idea here is, is just like the sleep, though, that both sleep and drunkenness make it improbable that we are prepared. Rather than sleeping or being drunk, we are to keep awake. We are to be sober. As we read earlier, the master of the house who acts as though his master will not return proves himself an unbeliever. That's in the end of Matthew 24. We are exhorted to be like the wise virgins, awake and sober, prepared for the return of Jesus. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. To be awake, to be sober, to be ready, to be waiting for the return of Jesus. The problem here is, is that people throughout all the ages sometimes have taken that in a weird kind of way. There's been people living in caves. There's been people climbing a mountain. There's been people who have sold everything, bought robes. This, this happens because we see these, these parables and we think, well, it, it could, be, could be tomorrow, could be tonight. And that's true, it could. But there's a story of, uh, I think it was uh, um, John Wesley. And somebody asked him, if you knew that the Lord was going to return next Wednesday, what would you do? What would you do? And he got out his schedule, and he looked up next Wednesday, and he said, I'm to have dinner at such and such a place. So I would go, and I would have dinner at such and such a place. It means doing the things that we're supposed to be about. Next Wednesday should be no different for the Christian if Jesus is returning on next Wednesday as it is if he is returning 2,000 Wednesdays after that, or 2,000 years of Wednesdays. It means getting up in the morning, feeding the family, working, cleaning up after yourself, being productive in your family and in society. When Paul says to put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation, this is what he's getting at. Let your ordinary life in the light of what, live your ordinary life in the light of what Christ has done for you. We are to put on these virtues of faith and love and hope. And whatever we do, we are to do all to the glory of God. The point is that Christians already know what we're to be doing. We are to be found faithful in the duties we've been given. The virgins were to be found faithful with the lamps. The master of the house was to be found faithful faithful in running the household. Those were the duties that they were given. Our faith is in Christ, our hope is in Christ, and our love is for Christ. Finally, encourage one another and build one another up. Final. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Here's the conclusion to what Paul is saying, that God has not destined us for wrath. Before the foundation of the world, Christ died for his people. That's, you know, this crazy language of things having been completed even before God said, let there be light. 
this unity of purpose in the Godhead, this plan of redemption, this I know the end from the beginning. God's purpose of creation was not simply to have little people hang around and admire him. He isn't incomplete without our worship. Our worship is proper for him because he is great and he is worthy. God is the only one who is worthy of all our admiration, adoration. God is the one who is worthy of all our praise. God is the one who is worthy of all our thanksgiving. He's worthy of all our effort. He's worthy of all our labor. He's the reason that we are not destined for wrath is because of his sheer grace. Because God freely chose some for honorable use. We obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, not by any merit of our own, simply because Christ died for us to redeem us to himself, to rescue us from darkness into light. There is no turning back. This is an encouragement. God has not destined us for wrath. If his blood is shed for you, it is shed for you. It is not sufficient one day and not good enough the next day. You are either children of light or children of darkness. Turn from idols to worship and serve the living and true God. Idols are nothing. Peace and security that any government can give you is an idol. Stop trusting in the security of your employment, your full deep freezer or whatever it is. These are things that I trust in all the time. If I don't have food in the deep freeze, I don't feel good. <laughs> These are easy words to say, but they're harder to put into action. It doesn't mean that I sit down and I worship my deep freeze, but I do put a lot of stock, literally, in my deep freeze. I know, I know all these things that God's, that, that my eternal security is what matters. I know that you know this. Paul is saying this because when times are hard, that's when this is all the more sweet. This is all the more precious. This is all the more needful. We make, we make a lot of different choices than the people around us. When I drive by my, my neighborhood, I see nicer vehicles than mine. We've made these choices. And, and I don't regret them. But sometimes your eyes can be drawn and you can wish that you had what your neighbors have, perhaps. We need to be able to draw each other's eyes to these eternal truths. That's why this word of encouragement is not given to one person, it's given to a church. It's given to the Church of the Thessalonians so that they can encourage one another, so that they can build one another up with this. We need to be outside of just ourselves. I often think of when, when we were living on the farm and we would drive by, there was this little brick house that uh, was maybe over 100 years old when nobody was living there. And I just think of the families that lived there. Somebody moved there, they had great hope for the future, they planted, they harvested, and then they were gone. I don't know what family lived there, I don't know who homesteaded there. And then one day we were driving back and the house was just gone, it was just gone, it was empty field, no trace of it at all. 
less than 100 years ago, right here, people lost everything during the dirty 30s. Read the minor prophets. People in those days, life was fragile. They could work their entire lives and then some band of marauders would come in and they would lose everything. Job lost pretty much everything. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can we say that? Why could Job say that? He could say that because he knew that his Redeemer lives and that he would see him one day face to face. I hope I can say that. Reminds me of the, that Jesus commends this guy. He wants his son to be healed. And, and Jesus says, have faith and it will be so. And the father says, I believe. Uh, Lord, help my unbelief. Right? And Jesus actually commends that. He knows that, believe, that, that when times are tough, putting faith into action is hard. These doctrines that we speak about today, the big picture, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, these are things that are not just for us to wrestle with as individuals. These are things to comfort each other with, to encourage each other toward, to build one another up with. We are to love one another. The Thessalonians were perhaps scared. Their resources were tapped. Their livelihoods were threatened. They needed to transition from their pagan or confrontational jobs to new, harder, more labor-intensive jobs. They perhaps were hoping to escape the hardships of the world. They perhaps would rather have lived in a monastery, escaped to a mountain retreat somewhere. But that would have been to let their lamps burn low that would not to have been about their Lord's business. <clears throat> Psalm 20. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The Lord is coming. Stay awake, stay sober, put on faith, love, and hope, and encourage one another. Build one another up. Let's pray.